What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD Mode podcast interview. Where every single week, I interview top entrepreneurs, top real estate professionals, and strip top badass so that they're dominating their spaces. So people choosing to not live a life of mediocrity, but instead to go out there and create big, amazing, epic lives for themselves, for their families, as well as have a big impact on others. And today, guys, got another special rock star guest on the show. Our guest today, guys, is the founder and CEO of Recession.com is an author, speaker, and an expert on recessions and why business owners don't need to fear them. Uh, formerly, before he got into what he's doing today, was in, uh, in investment banking, working with a lot of mergers, acquisitions, and has seen the inner workings of what creates a successful company, but also why they crumble as well. So really stoked and honored to have Jonathan Slain on the show, the show my friend. Thanks for having me on, dude. Really good to be here. Yeah, man, I'm stoked, dude. And, and uh, I know we were talking before we hit the record button here. It's, you know, with, with I mean, I think all entrepreneurs fear, I shouldn't say all entrepreneurs, but a, a lot of them fear recessions. And I can only really speak to the real estate industry because that's been my whole, entrepreneur. you know, 15 years of entrepreneur experience has been in that industry. Um, but man, they're, they're, especially right now in this time, because we, are going against what the second longest bull market recorded history and probably one of the longest, if not the longest seller's market and, and continuing appreciation. And there's not a day that goes by where I don't get asked from a real estate professional of when, when's the next recession. And, and you can hear the fear, you know, right. Of um, uh, coming from that. So I know that you're going to be doing a lot of value. I'm excited to pick your brain and we can all learn from you. But before we get into all the things you're doing today, dude, I'm, always intrigued in our guest journeys that led them here in the first place. I mean, like what led you from, um, what led you to investment banking in the first place, but then from there, what led you into entrepreneurship and what you're doing today? Sure. So I uh, went to the university of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So I'm a Tar Heel. And while I was there, I really majored in great professors and so just figured out which professors were the ones that were highest rated and took all of those. And as it happened, uh, I was most of the way to a political science degree uh, by the time I did that. And so I finished that degree up. So that's actually my degree, which uh, qualified me to do almost nothing uh, <laughs> graduating school, except then uh, when I graduated, uh, needed to, uh, to get employed. And so I um, had an opportunity to start working uh, at a local bank here in Cleveland uh, and from there, um, moved into their investment banking department. Uh, as, uh, as we tell the story, they needed somebody in investment banking that could write good. Um, and, and, and I convinced them that I was that guy. Um, so was able to do the part of uh, investment banking where when a company wants to be sold, somebody's got to tell their story and somebody else has to kind of write all the numbers up for how you value the business and so my part of, of the gig was helping to write the story and tell the story of that business. Um, from there, uh, I, I spent 80 to 100 hours a week doing investment banking. And so in people years, uh, I had four years of experience during my first uh, two years working there. And I, I went with my brother-in-law. He asked me if I would accompany him to Denver, Colorado to check out a franchise he was interested in buying. He uh, wanted to make sure that he wasn't going to get screwed. So he said, will you come to Denver, check out this franchise with me and let me know what you think since you're buying and selling businesses all the time. And so I went to Denver, checked out this franchise called Fitness Together, all personal training franchises. And on the flight home, I said, dude, why don't I leave the bank and do this with you? And so that was how I first got into franchise. Uh, did that for close to a decade and really through that discovered that what I really love to do, what I was put on earth to do is more uh, writing, speaking, um, consulting, coaching, all that stuff. That's the stuff I love to do in our franchise business, in our gyms. And so at some point uh, three years ago, my brother-in-law and I had a conversation and he said, you know, you're spending a lot of time consulting for other companies why don't you sell me your half of the business and you go do that and I'll do this. Uh, and so that's what happened. So then uh, fell into consulting and being a, uh, a full-time author. 
Yeah, love it, dude. So what um, what was it about the the franchise that you saw when you were in Denver that made you jump that ship? You know, right? Because I'm sure that as an investment banker, you see the good, bad, the ugly, you know, right? So you can see the risk. You can see the, you know, so I'm sure it had to be something pretty compelling to, to make you make that shift, that transition in that moment. Yeah. I, so the moment uh, that I always think about here is that I was standing on my brother-in-law's back porch and we were having a conversation and I was wearing my gray suit and I, I had my tie loosened. It was after a long week. And my brother-in-law looked at me and he said, you know, I think that uh, all those hours sitting under the fluorescent lights are making you green. Yeah. Like literally, like my skin was green uh, and I was pale and green and wearing a, a, a suit that was gray and drab. And, you know, all of a sudden, I don't think, um, I wasn't running towards something, <laughs> Josh. I think I was really running away from um, just 80 to 100 hours a week working for someone else. And for me, I can't say I'm working a lot less right now, um, but it is all for me, for my family. And I think that's just, um, it was really discovering something that was always there. But those two years of experience um, working for someone else just reaffirmed that um, it, it's just, I'm too broken um, to work for somebody else. Um, I've got a transistor that I think is broken off in my brain where um, it just doesn't, it doesn't work for me. And I, I know when my, I left my boss um, in investment banking, who's still a friend and a mentor today, that when I told him I was leaving, he told me, you know what, that makes sense because you're too much of a pain in the ass to work for anybody <laughs> anyways. Um, he was saying it with all due love, um, but he was right. So that, that's really, that's what happened there. Yeah. Yeah, what was um, curious after, you know, because I'll, I'll talk with, uh, you know, let's just say Fortune 500 consultants that do that journey for some time, but then they get into their first business venture. And sometimes there's, you think you're prepared because you're consulting so much and doing this, but then, you know, there's always those uh, learning moments that maybe you didn't expect or understand. When you made that transition and you were, before you started on your, your venture now three years ago, but when you're in the fitness industry, what were some of those kind of like learning moments that you didn't anticipate or didn't expect? It, again, it goes back to a, a vignette for me. I know that I was uh, 25 years old and I had 25 employees. Uh, and I, I don't think I'll ever forget that because I also had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> and we, we, were, we had five different locations, so I had five people in each of those five locations all over the city of Cleveland and didn't know anything about management or leadership and had all these people relying on me uh, to feed their families and for them to get their paycheck every two weeks. And so I guess that was one of those real turning points, one of the moments. And for me, um, I luckily at the time happened to be in the entrepreneurs organization. So I don't know if, you, um, if you've heard of that or if you guys have chapters of that, but it's like YPO, the Young Presidents Organization. Uh, but in any case, my, um, the, the other people in the organization with me gave me a lot of coaching, mentorship, and help. I found this book called Traction by Gino Wickman, uh, you know, the entrepreneurial operating system and started using traction in our gym businesses uh, and that really helped to get us on track and get our franchises to be at the top of the system. And so we actually, we had the top franchise out of the, you know, the hundreds of franchises that were out there for fitness together. And I think a lot of that was due to actually having a process in place and just following that game plan. So I um, was fortunate to just run into that book and then decide to execute it. Yeah, love it, dude. So then three years ago, you, you break off and, and start your own consulting company. I, I'm curious with the with the recession.com and the push. And the, yeah. Was that just, is that more recent as far as, you know, kind of the, the branding name shift change or like, I mean, what led from the consulting to really, I guess, brand your company in that way? Yeah, so uh, I still operate with uh, two brands, which is probably, uh, if I talk to marketing people, that's probably a mistake, but I still do Autobahn consultants, you know, helping companies go fast without crashing into the wall. And then um, the recession thing, 
I wish I could tell you, Joshua, that it came about as like a, a, a master plan. But what was really going on is that two years ago, uh, I started to get nervous about all of my clients, many of whom are contractors, not being prepared for the next recession. And started to think that uh, if the contractors that worked for and with me went out of business in a recession, that would be bad for them and would be bad for me. Because if the client goes out of business, the consultant doesn't have much to consult on. And I thought that if anybody um, should be picking their head up and looking out into the future, that's really my role. Like that's what I'm supposed to be doing for my clients. They're busy running their businesses. I'm supposed to be helping them see around the corner. And so all this started with me collecting a workbook of activities that we could do together to help them plan for the next recession. And then when I started doing all that stuff with my clients at their sessions, because um, I, I work with each client um, for a full day, once a quarter, or we do strategic planning stuff, when they really seemed to vibe with that and they got back to me that they really loved that work that we were doing, that got me to thinking that maybe there was a bigger market for it than just my clients. And ultimately that led to the book book. Um, so that led to writing the actual Rock the Recession book. And my business partner and mentor and friend, Paul Belair, that I put the book together with, um, he's got a story where in the last recession, he, he bought his company uh, for, he invested a million dollars with his team. They grew the business and then they sold it after 63 months for over 70 million. That's crazy. And yeah, for the audience that's, that's um, trying to do, do the math on that, it, he invested a million with his team and then they sold it for over 70 million five years later. And it contrasts with my story in the, the, the Great Recession, which is that when the recession hit, nobody wanted to buy personal training. And I was huddled in the, in, in the fetal position in the corner of my office, just trying to survive. So I think also Paul and I just thought that the compare and contrast of his story and my story just had to be a book. So that's what happened. Yep, yep, love it. Now, going through this, you know, it's, 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 so much of, of, I guess, business and, and success is just solving our own problems. And, you know, like you had this personal fear of, hey, man, well, if we hit a recession and I lose my clients, then what am I going to do? Um, so it started really with you solving your own problem. But I, I am curious, right, of, you know, because you have, you have recessions that do happen, um, but there's always change that's taking place. Like one thing that's happening, I think in a lot of industries, but it's really entering the real estate industry because the real estate industry for some reason operates like 20 years behind all the other industries with technology and whatever. And now we're seeing a lot of disruption in the industry due to technology. Um, but there's always, you know, we're always having to change and adapt. And so I'm curious with doing this, this work to kind of recession proof yourself and your business, as well as, you know, just a, overall consulting work that you you've done over the years like was there was there much of a difference that you found preparing for a recession versus just doing the the preparation for creating a successful business whatever that change shift and adaption may be yeah i think a lot of uh the recession planning is really just good business hygiene so the recession happens to be a good marketing wrapper for me to put around a lot of the strategic planning pieces that we talk about in the book. And at the same time, there are a few differences between recession planning and strategic planning that are important. But to answer your question, a lot of the things that companies do to prepare for recessions and to look forward to them are some of the basic building blocks that you should be doing anyways as a business owner, if you're a solopreneur or if you're running a hundred million dollar business. So. And, and the, the other thing I want to say about um, the point you're bringing up is I know some of the audience might be listening and saying, you know, look, I, 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 I think that the, the real estate market is strong and I don't uh, agree with Jonathan that a recession is coming up um, in 2020. I think it might be a 2021 thing or a 2022 thing. Everything that I'm talking about applies to non-economic recessions as well as economic recessions. So what, what I mean by that, Joshua, is just simply that if, you're, if you've got a big client that you're doing a lot of real estate deals with and they leave you, 
then you're in a recession regardless of what's going on in the economy. If you find out that uh, somebody embezzled money from your bank account, your business account, then you're going to be in a recession regardless. If you're running a small agency and your three or four best agents leave and go start a competing agency, which I'm sure has that ever happened in, um, in the history of, of real estate? Yeah, that I happened? think anybody has a team of brokerage that's happened to. <laughs> okay, so your, your three best brokers leave or your best broker leaves and all of a sudden is across the street competing with you. You're super pissed off, nothing you can do not going to try to enforce it on compete. It's not enforceable in your state or you're not going to spend the 10 grand on the lawsuit, whatever. You're in a recession. All those scenarios that I just rattled off, those all can be handled by a recession plan. So my point is just, you should have a written recession plan, do the planning, put it in a glass case, hang it up on the wall. And when a recession hits you, go break the glass and execute your plan. That's what I want for people because otherwise uh, you're going to be making decisions when you're emotional, when you're pissed off that one of your uh, best brokers left and started a competing firm, when you're upset that you just found out that somebody embezzled from you and you feel betrayed and you feel stupid because you didn't catch it. So all of those things can put you into to a recession. And I think that's a lot of um, what we're talking about as well. Yeah, no, I, I love that. I love the analogy or the, the statement they made of, uh, of being just good personal like business hygiene, you know, right? Of, I, I mean, the toughest time I've had in business isn't when the actual country was in a recession. It was when I got comfortable, I stopped doing the, the fundamentals that created the success in the first place, stopped paying attention, you know, right? And then boom, something happens, you know, right? And then, yeah. You know, and then I swear I'll never repeat those mistakes again. Two, three years later, <laughs> they just get repeated. And then it's like, oh man, if I just never stopped doing the things and the fundamentals that I did to create the success, these things wouldn't happen. But it just, man, history repeats itself, whether it's on a big scale or just us as human beings and business operators. Um, well, dude, so I'm, I'm totally with you on that. And I mean, this, this period of growth, is crazy unprecedented. It's been over a decade since we've had a recession. So people get complacent. And I am guessing that a lot of your audience may not have had their, um, their business. They may not have been selling real estate um, back when the last recession hit. Because unless you started your business over 10 years ago, you've never been through a recession with your current um, real estate business. So uh, you've just got to start to think about what's it going to look like or how am I going to get information and make decisions now so that I can be looking forward to it. And I was excited about um, being on with you because there's especially so much opportunity that you don't have um, outside of a recession. When one hits, you can do so much more with real estate, get so much more leverage, but you've got to have a plan so that you can pounce. I want people to be looking forward to it and that's what I think was original about our book is that there's been books about how to just survive recessions. That's been done before. What this is about is how do we study the people who have used recessions for leverage, use recessions to hack the system and really get breakout growth. That's what I'm all about. That gets me fired up. It's not just how do we survive. That's easy. Just cut overhead, fire people, you'll survive, and then you can do it all over again. Yeah. No, I love it, man. I love it. Yeah, dude. And, and if you look at, you know, I know that all the stats get thrown out of uh, being one of the best times, that, you know, whatever, but it's like, look, yeah. I don't know anybody that, in, in let's just say corporate America, that has gotten a raise without, let's just say maybe they got a 20% raise, but they're having to work three times the hours, you know, right? Where, like, I mean, everything's getting more expensive. Real estate's getting more expensive, but people aren't, you know, just your, your average working, hardworking middle class, like isn't making more money. And I, I always look around like, how long can this keep going? And whether, you know, and I don't like to speculate a whole lot because all I can do is prepare for myself. Um, um, but then, and you, you probably know the stat uh, much better than I will. And I don't know if this is true, but I've heard before that there's more millionaires and wealth created in recessions and depressions than at any other times. Is that, is that statement true? I believe so. I mean, it's, it's just the disruption. So 
again, the idea here is that um, if you have a war chest, if you have saved up cash, then you can buy a lot more. Your dollar goes further in recessions than it does otherwise. That's the whole Warren Buffett idea of I try to run in the opposite direction of what everyone else is doing. Warren wants to be a buyer when everybody else in the market is scared and selling their stocks and bailing out of the market because he can buy for cheap. Likewise, I want to be buying real estate when everybody else is trying to sell and vice versa. Uh, so that's a, a lot of um, the idea here is you have to have a plan though because unless you've built up that war chest, unless you've got access to a line of credit or access to debt, or you have a pile of cash, you're not going to have big opportunities in a recession regardless. So you're just going to miss the opportunity to pounce if you're not smart enough to be listening to us and, and getting jacked up about how you can really rock the next recession. Yeah, love it. So that so we've kind of talked about the, the why and the opportunities yep. that are created. And then if, now if you were to get into the actual planning process, you know, right. Um, can you kind of walk us through like what, what that might look like or where people would start with the planning process, you know, for whatever this next shift may be. And like you said, I love that you hit on a, a recession doesn't necessarily mean it's a, you know, a countrywide thing, right? Like we got to treat our own businesses, our own selves as our own economies. And what, what I should know, this is bad that I don't, but what the recession is what, like three or four consecutive quarters of decline? Uh, I, so it's technically defined as two quarters of a decline in GDP. Uh, okay. And so for the audience out there listening, we haven't had uh, even one quarter so far of a decline in GDP in the U.S., so you've got um, some runway, you've got six months until we officially could be in a recession. And uh, in the US, we announce uh, things a quarter in arrears, which is just a fancy way of saying at the end of December, they'll let us know if the third quarter was better or worse than the second quarter. So you, you have some time before we're going to be in a recession, which is great because that means uh, that you've got time to get prepared for it. But to answer your question, the first step, which we call first gear in our model, is to assess where you are. So you can, uh, and, and so you want to benchmark how prepared you are versus all of the other brokers, versus everyone else in real estate, versus everyone else uh, in your industry. And Paul and I put together 20 questions. It, they're on recession.com. It's free. You can go there. You can fill out the assessment. You'll get a score from zero to 100. If you get a zero, that means you're not at all prepared for the next recession. If you get 100, that means you're super prepared and should be looking forward to it because of the opportunities you'll have. And what we found from the 1,000 uh, plus responses we've gotten so far is that the average right now is a 37. So if you score above a 37, then you're probably in pretty good shape. And below a 37, again, need to start really thinking through what can you do to be better prepared. So first step, I mean, in anything in life is really to just benchmark where you are so that you can then start to think through what are the steps to improve and to get to where I want to be. Yeah, that's, that's awesome, man. Because, you know, like when, you, when you're talking about the assessment, my mind just quickly goes to like the uh, doing a SWOT analysis. Yeah. But the hard part I've had with the SWOT analysis is like, because there's not like a series of explicit questions to figure out, okay, well, what are my threats? What are my weaknesses? Like, I, you know, I, I don't know if, if you've ever found that to be a challenge, but when I'm doing them, I'm like, well, what do I, all sounds pretty, but what am I really supposed to fucking do here? You know, yeah, right? So what, what, one of the specific things like SWAT um, is kind of uh, the old school strategic planning. I would say if you um, are listening to us and you want to update, then think about blue ocean planning. Um, it's a book by Kim and Mauburn. Um, I talk about it in our book. But what I do like about Blue Ocean Planning is that it asks you to think through, instead of SWAT, which is what are our strengths, our weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, the Blue Ocean Planning asks, what are we doing in our business right now that we could eliminate? What are we doing in our business that we could reduce? What could we raise? And what could we create with all the time that we're going to save from eliminating things and reducing things? And I find the output from that blue ocean planning 
to be a lot more actionable than the SWOT analysis. And so as part of our work with rocking the recession, I would recommend you consider all the blue ocean stuff. So if you're um, an agent, if you're a broker, when was the last time you just did a time study of how you're spending your days? You know, what all I mean by that is every 30 minutes, you're just writing down what you're doing for a week. And then at the end of the week, you're going back through and you're putting into buckets all the different things you're doing. So maybe I sent emails for an hour. I did showings for two hours. I worked the phones for leads for an hour. At the end of the week, you can take a look and start to figure out what am I doing just because I always do it? What could I eliminate? And if I eliminated it, it wouldn't affect my profits. It wouldn't affect how many sales I make. It wouldn't affect the customer experience with me. And then you can get rid of that. I promise you, Josh, I promise the audience out there, if you do this, you can find 10% of your time that you can just eliminate. Things you're doing that don't move you forward and nobody probably cares, you're just doing them because you've always run that report and it's kind of interesting to get whatever report you're running and look at it. But if it doesn't change your behavior, then I would just not do it. And so I think that's, what, um, that's one of those behaviors we talk about in the book if people want to to move themselves forward. So sorry, I know that was kind of a tangent, but when you brought up the SWAT thing, I couldn't help myself. Yeah, no, I love it, dude. All right, so then, okay, so you, you got the assessment of, of where you're at. Um, then once you've done the assessment, because you, you mentioned that is, what do you call it, first gear. First gear, so that's first gear. Yep. Second, second gear is to tune yourself up. So looking at your personal life and looking at your business, how buttoned down are you? How ready are you for a recession? So questions there are, how's your current uh, debt level? What does it look like for your line of credit? So if you're a small business owner and you have a line of credit, do you have enough credit available to allow you to grow in a recession or to cover your operating expenses so that you can survive through a recession? And then if you've got bank loans um, for your agency, then do you know what the covenants are in those bank loans? Do you have personal guarantees on any of your debt or your properties? So thinking through some of those, like right now, uh, when it comes to all the banking things, right now, since the economy is at a peak in the US, this is the ideal time to change up all those banking relationships, to go back to your banker and ask for more credit or to ask for a reduction in your personal guarantees, ask them to waive the personal guarantees, ask them to cap them. Now is when you can do that. When we're actually in a recession, if you go to your bank and ask them for any of that, they're just going to laugh at you. So I like to bring it up now because a lot of people are complacent, not really thinking about it, not worried about it because a lot of people aren't using a lot of debt right now um, and aren't uh, into their line of credit but this is the perfect time to go have that conversation. Yeah, love it. Yeah, it reminds me when I, so when the market crashed in what, 2008, at least here in Phoenix, Arizona, one of the opportunities was now working for the financial institutions, representing them selling all their assets, right? They're, they're foreclosures, or they call them REOs. Um, but one of the stipulations there is the real estate agent, like I had to fund all their utilities, cash for keys, repairs, and you know, very quickly, I got myself after, I don't know, six months of doing it, about a quarter million dollars in, in receivables. Money you're loaning them essentially to cover utilities, whatever, you get paid back, but there's that bridge, you know, and, and I hadn't prepared for that. Now, luckily I had some reserves and didn't have debt, so I had some cash, but when things got tight, because I didn't have the line of credit beforehand, now I go to the bank, there, there was no line of credits. You know, so I'm doing credit card cash advances just to come up with enough working capital, you know, right, to, to kind of ride that storm where that preparation would have avoided all of that. Yeah, I mean, you're making the point for me. Uh, I completely agree. The other thing is that in the, the Great Recession, one of the opportunities I had was that the banks called me when another gym or fitness place went out of business, and they would ask me if I wanted to buy that gym's equipment. Uh, similarly, um, banks are not in the business of owning fitness equipment any more than they're in the business of owning real estate. Um, so they don't want that Oreo that other real estate <laughs> owned. 
um, they want other people to take it off their books. And so the banks would call me and say, we know you own gyms. We can send you over a list of all this fitness equipment. And they would send me a list that was thirty dollars or $40,000 worth of equipment. And I would tell them that, you know, at most I wanted to, to give them a thousand or two thousand and they would always go, okay, let me call you back. They would call me back an hour later and say, if you'll overnight us a certified check for 2000, you can have it. The point there is that I got a smoking deal because they were doing the math on what it would cost them to have to go take possession of the equipment. They would have to get guys to load it onto trucks. They'd have to take it and store it at a warehouse. They'd have to conduct an auction. The auction gets a third of the money. And so for them, if they can just get out of it without losing money, that's actually better for them. The reason I'm telling you the story though, Joshua, is the, I had those opportunities because I had created relationships with the banks to let them know before we got into the recession that if we got into the recession, I wanted to be their first call and that I was a buyer. I wasn't going to mess them around. If they called me, I would quickly um, give them a yes or no decision and I'd be in a position to overnight them a check. And so then those phone calls were inbound, but you can't do that when we're already in a recession because guys like me already have relationships established. And if you're out there listening to this, I want people to make those relationships with the bank like the one that you had. So they're calling all of your audience, uh, trying to offload their REO onto them. What a great opportunity that is. Yeah. Yep. Love it. Yeah. And, 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 you know, to that point, it's like, you, you want to put yourself in a position that your competitors, you know, can't, can't be in, you know, right. Um, yeah. So then with that, you know, it's like, okay, I can get reserves in my, my business, whatever, but can you speak a little bit to the importance or, or what your philosophies are on the personal side of things? You know, cause I see so many that, especially in real estate, man, it's like first ones to go out there and buy the nice car, the nicer houses, the keeping up with the Joneses game and, you know, it's difficult to make transition and shifts when you're carrying a lot of, you know, personal debt as well. Yeah, I, for me, the way that I look at it, I run my personal financial life like a business. So my wife and I uh, have our own family profit and loss statement. We have a family balance sheet. We have a family cash flow statement. And every month our bookkeeper um, sorts everything. And then at the end of the month, they send us a financial packet so that we can go through together and see how we did versus our budget. And so that keeps us honest. And it's also allowed us to discover some surprising things. We could not believe how much money we spent on eating out and eating out doesn't bring us that much joy. So just awareness of that allowed us to make some changes and so I think for most people, they probably spend money like I did before we got into this practice uh, without having any idea of how much their inflows are and their outflows are and making decisions about where they want to be personally and then running it like a business. So that would probably be the first thing I would do for the audience out there is you may want to do this yourself. You can do it through QuickBooks online. It's very easy to set up your um, family finances. Or if you, um, you know, you're just not detail oriented or you, you don't get it when it comes to accounting, you can hire somebody. Uh, it's not that expensive so that you can really start to get your personal house in order and to get buttoned down. Because un unless you are buttoned down personally, then none of the rest of the stuff we're talking about is going to matter in a recession. Yep. Yep. Love it. Um, all right. So then you got, so the second gear, tuning yourself up. Yep. Yep. And then so third gear is where we're going to race. And by race, I mean, these are all the things about improving your business. So what are you doing to make sure that you're productive and that your brokers have productivity measures uh, every day? So do your brokers know, do you know how you win? So in other words, as a leader and manager, a lot of the times we don't tell the people working for us or we don't tell ourselves what we need to do on a day-to-day -day basis to win. Maybe you need to make 10 outbound phone calls um, each day. Maybe it's 50, maybe it's 100. But do you know what that metric is? And do you hold yourself or the people working for you accountable for it? Everybody deserves to know, you know, how do we get a first down? How do we move the chains? 
And I think in a lot of cases, we just show up to work every day and we just, you know, all right, I guess I'll just look at my emails, see who needs something. I'll take whatever phone calls happen to come in and then I'll just kind of get as much done as I can. So the race gear is about you being intentional about improving your productivity. And it's about improving the culture of your workplace. So your culture, if you're a solopreneur, would be, you know, where are you working? How are you doing that? How do you feel about it? And if you have an agency, it's thinking about the culture of your entire organization. You wanna have those things tight now before we're in a recession, because once we're in a recession, your culture is going to get tested. Productivity measures are going to get tested. You don't wanna to have to figure all that stuff out when um, we're going down the highway, going 70. That's not a good time to try to change the tire. You wanna handle that now, make sure that you're um, tight and ready to go for fourth gear, which is when we start to hit the gas and accelerate. Yeah, love it. So when it comes to you know, the, the KPIs or the vitals or you know, the key performances of, you know, it, you know, sometimes it could be hard to identify those. And, and what I mean by this is, you know, for the longest time I would being in sales and, and whatever, it was like, okay, like the sales aspect was easy, you know, right. Of, okay. I knew if I had X amount of leads coming in from these lead sources, did X amount of dials, conversations, appointments set, like everything would fall into place. But then as I started to expand in different positions, um, like bringing on graphic designers, bringing on film editors, bringing on, you know, um, whatever it may be, just a, a, a position that might be a little bit more difficult to develop and identify like what those KPIs are to know if they're winning and you for to know they're winning. And what kind of suggestions would you have for people to identify those, um, you know, for their teams, for their, their staff? Yeah, so I want the audience uh, to think now about your, your at your favorite uh, vacation spot. So for me, um, let's say it's the Bahamas and I'm on the beach and you can imagine that the cabana boy or the cabana girl, uh, take your pick, they bring over a sheet of paper and it's got five to 15 numbers on it that lets you know how your business is doing. What are the five to 15 numbers you would wanna know on a weekly basis? so that you could decide whether or not to order another pina colada or to hightail it to the airport so that you could get back to your business. That's what I want people thinking about. And so often I find that people have way too many numbers that they're trying to juggle, or they have numbers that they think are nice to know, but that don't change their behavior. So I would really recommend that the audience think through what are the numbers that I need to know that change my behavior? And those are the right ones to be watching on a weekly basis. If it's just something that's nice to know that isn't going to change your behavior immediately, then I would save that for your monthly financial packet. So for example, if you know that you need to make 10 calls a day to hit your number for um, what you'll be comfortable with um, for your sales and your profit that'll go in your pocket, and you saw that only seven of those calls happened, then immediately you would know you need to make 13 calls to catch yourself up. So that may be a number. If on the other hand, you're like, you know, I've always wondered how many um, leads we get on the website a day. And I think I'll look at that. And it's not going to change your behavior, whether it's 50 or 250, because you don't know what it should be in any case then I would just ignore that number and focus on the few that actually can move you forward. And then I guess my last thought there is to focus more on the leading um, indicators versus the lagging indicators. So, I mean, I don't know uh, if, if um, it looks like you're nodding your head, so you've heard this one before, but to the extent that you can focus on the leading indicators, uh, which are the things you can control, more so than the results, which are the lagging indicators, I think that shift will help out. So for example, you can always control how many phone calls you make a day. No matter what, you can make 50 phone calls if you wanna make 50 phone calls. You can't control how many um, of those that you convert 
um, to uh, an in-person meeting. So there's a lot of variables. It could be that all 50 people that you call uh, don't pick up the phone because they're busy. It could be all 50 of the people that you call happen to be booked for the next two months. But no matter what, you can control making 50 outbound calls. And so I always like to focus as leading as possible for me and the people working with me. Yeah, love it. Um, yeah, powerful stuff. And then is there, you know, I, I've heard different philosophies on this. Um, like Infusionsoft, for example, they, they have what they call their big three. And each person is responsible for these three things. And that rolls up to the department and then so forth. And, you know, but some might have fewer, some might have more. Because I, I'm, I'm a data freak. So I make the mistake sometimes. Like when you talk about over-tracking, that's me which can overwhelm your people, you know, right. Of, of seeing the data, reporting the data, you know, I mean, do you, if to get them to know if they're winning or losing and you're having them on those lead measures versus the lag. Um, I mean, is there, is there too much thing is just too much where you just seem bloated? Like, should you like, Hey man, no more than three, find the three most important that they report on data that they see and just keep it simplified. Yeah, for me, I'd be looking at five to 15 numbers max per week. And I think less is more. So if you can get it down to five, if you can get down to a vital three um, and really understand um, the pulse of your business, then more power to you. I think um, in most cases though, uh, I'm thinking five to 15 is about how, num how many numbers I'd want to be looking at. And then I'd also be thinking through, if you're looking at a quarter, so 13 weeks, you don't want, um, you want to set a goal for each one of your, um, of your numbers. And then you don't want to be green on all those numbers or above or at goal more than maybe twice a quarter. If you are, if you're green every week on all of your numbers, then I think you need to stretch your goals out, right? Um, and if you're never green on them, then I think you need to have a serious conversation with yourself or with your team about whether or not you're stretching yourself too far and you're just not there yet. But I feel like a good balance is that if you're all green twice a quarter, you can feel pretty good that um, that's about stretchy enough because you're also talking to a growth guy. I mean, I really believe that if we're not growing our business top line and bottom line, that we're dying. Yep, yep, love it. So then is there is there a gear beyond the third? Yeah, so fourth gear is accelerate. And earlier we touched on, this is the gear where you can um, jump on the gas and you're going to be in a position to now buy assets, uh, to be able to buy um, other companies. Um, if that's something that's of interest, maybe um, other agencies that weren't smart enough to listen to, to our podcast and our conversation, um, they didn't have a strong balance sheet and now they're falling apart, um, but it's a good bolt on for you. You know, there may be a competitor out there that drives you crazy because it seems like their marketing's always a little bit sharper, or maybe they're always poaching your best, um, uh, your best um, agents from you, um, and so your best brokers. So in a recession though, maybe that um, pain in the ass competitor could be a great acquisition for you to tuck into your business. And so you wanna be working now to form relationships because in a recession, it will be a lot easier for them to be like, oh, well, that Joshua guy, he's a good dude. And I know that we're competitors, but I also know that he's pretty buttoned down. And if anybody could afford to, uh, to give me some money so that I could get out of this, it might be him. So then maybe they call you. That makes it a lot easier than if you're trying to reach out proactively in a recession and everybody um, feels like you're just being opportunistic and taking advantage of them. Yeah, love it. So in the book, man, is the, the book really geared around or or I mean these these main gears, but then the in-depth how-tos as far as implementation and Yeah, I mean so there's four main gears and then lastly there's the emergency break. And that emergency break is really your traditional recession plan. So I know that I'm the look looking forward to recessions guy. Um, and yet at the same time, I do believe that business owners, that all of us should have a plan. So our emergency break is what do you do if all this stuff that we've been talking about isn't working and you can't step on the gas, uh, it's broken, 
um, then you need to have that emergency break so that you can cut overhead so that you could reduce the number of people in your office so that you can just survive. I mean, at the end of the day, if we're entrepreneurs, then we need to protect the beehive. We need to survive the next recession. So the emergency break is having that plan in place so that you can say, look, if I saw um, my number of leads drop from um, my usual volume to 10% less, then this is the overhead I would cut. Or we mentioned earlier that uh, if you're an agent and you've gone out and leased uh, a Mercedes or a BMW and you saw um, your personal um, profit or distributions drop, at what point are you going to predetermine that you're going to have to turn in that lease? I want you to do that now because the pain of writing that plan down means that you're going to fight like hell to make sure that you never have to use it. And if you do have to use it, you'll have a plan so that you're not stuck with that car way longer than you would have been if you had held yourself to the decision that you made during the cool rational light of day rather than the emotional heat of the night when everything's falling down around you and you're bummed out that you have to turn in your car on top of everything else. Yeah, yeah, I love it, dude. Um, yeah, man, it's, you know, because one of the issues with <clears throat> when, when you start creating a lot of success, I mean, one, one of them is sometimes it's easy to get a little full of yourself, you know, right? Like when you're stacking so many wins after time, like you kind of feel like, ah, you're, you know, maybe you're not going to fail. You can't, you know, right. And I'm speaking to my, one of my own personal situations in 2007, 2017, um, I, I didn't correctly evaluate my capacity and I started seven new strategic partnerships. So I got to the point where I had 10 total companies um, and most of them strategic partnerships, but it, dude, it just, I was way a bond. I mean, everything looked good, you know, on, on paper per se. What I didn't account for though was, was time and, and the capacity, you know, the capacities that it would take. And, and then next thing, you know, everything starts to come down, you know, right. right. Um, and I quickly had to, to exit from five companies. Um, and if I would have had a plan in place like this, man, you know, could have saved me millions, you know, right? Uh, of that and tough learning experiences that we have to go through. But do you have is is and I don't know if that's part of one of these gears, but is controlling our own personal capacities like like how do we know, like you know, when to pump the brakes for that? Yeah, I, it really comes down to that emergency break and figuring out what the right metrics are for you. So, in a business, it could be that if you're used to doing a million dollars a year in revenue, but you saw that your run rate was getting down closer to 800,000, then what has to go? What do you have to cut in order to start to pump the brakes? If you saw that your run rate was trending down towards 700,000 or 600,000 or 500,000, what would the additional cuts be? Or who would the people on your team be that you let go of first so that you could stay profitable? And I think for, for you and other solopreneurs, myself included, we need to figure out how much personal capacity we have. And if I see that I'm running out of hours in the day, or if I see that I'm working 80 hours a week, then maybe I have to pump the brakes at that point. But a lot of that requires the discipline to slow down and take a day and to just do some planning for ourselves. And I think a lot of the issue for us that are solopreneurs that are listening is just that we, uh, we spend more time planning for Christmas in the holidays than we do planning where we want our lives to go and what we want to do. And so part of this is just figuring out for yourself personally, what's your capacity? Where do you want to focus your energy? And how do you want to take that um, into the future? So uh, for me, that's an exercise that I'm doing twice a year with my wife to just understand what our life plan is and to lay out what strategically we want to focus on for the coming year so that we have our priorities down. We know what our North Star is. And then everything that um, comes towards me that isn't part of helping move me towards my goals can be a quick but firm no, because I've just already figured out what it is that I want to be focusing on. That's why it's easy for me to give you a quick yes about being able to be on the show today. Uh, but if I'm getting opportunities that are outside of uh, the recession planning thing to focus on other things, it's just not a fit for me right now because I know that I'm heads down on this project.
that's what I want for your audience is just that they figured that out so that they have that defensive shield to use because we're all constantly getting opportunities thrown at us. Yeah, love it, love it. So, you know, getting, like, I love reading and I love learning from from books and, and but then also there's a, 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 for me anyway, I find it necessary when running my business because you're in the thick of it and you get emotional. Like, I love having the person in the skybox, you know, and I'm a huge believer in coaches and consultants and and uh, uh, that can keep me in a line, alignment because I've proven myself too many times in the past where, you know, I, I, I'm not correcting myself fast enough or, or whatever, you know, right? Um, and I know that you also do have the, the consulting firm. Um, is the consulting that you guys do really in alignment with, with what you're talking about today and with the book and, and walking people through this process, but then also helping them stay accountable to this and making these right decisions? Yeah, so we, uh, we do strategic planning with companies and we meet with them once a quarter. At that quarterly meeting, we go over their mission, vision, values, all that type of work, and then we set quarterly goals. We come back the next quarter, make sure that we hold the company accountable to accomplishing the goals, and then we set the next quarter's goals and we do that together. And a lot of the value there is just because I'm working with 20 different companies at a time, I understand which goals can be accomplished in the quarter, which goals will actually move you forward and make money for the company and be profitable, improve the customer experience, and which goals will simply keep you busy. And so a lot of the work there is helping to hold companies accountable, to hold better meetings that are productive, uh, and to really move it forward, figure out how to structure the company for growth, and also to create maximum value for when people want to sell the company. Uh, the recession planning is always part of our work. I mean, I can't, uh, it's part of the fabric of who I am at this point. So that's all part of the engagement when we do work with companies um, as well. Yeah, love it. Powerful stuff, man. And John, where is, for those that are watching, listening, um, for them to go check out the book, snag a copy of the book, but also learn more about you, your company, what you guys do. I know you got a lot of great content out there. You talked about the also the, the exercise that you have, the, I think the, the recession proof actual survey, the planning survey or the assessment, like wh where are the best places to go do all of that at? Yeah, so recession.com is the hub for everything that we've been talking about. Um, yes, uh, we really did get that website. And uh, on there is the free 20 question assessment. So it pops up right on the home screen when you go, um, the home page when you go to recession.com. My contact info is on there. It's just Jonathan at recession.com. I'm always happy to, to talk with um, business owners, solopreneurs uh, that want more resources, um, as well as um, talk about consulting if that's ever of interest as well. Love it, man. Love it. And the, you guys, wherever you're watching and listening, we're going to have all that contact information right below. We'll make it super easy. We can just click those links and go check that stuff out. Uh, and I always end the podcast with this one last question here. But knowing everything you know now today, you know, throughout this, this journey of not just entrepreneurship, but I guess uh, uh, your, your investment banking days as well. If the Jonathan right now today could go back to the Jonathan, let's just say when you're finishing college and starting this, this journey, go back and give yourself two pieces of advice that you feel would have just fast forward your trajectory of, of success. What would those two pieces of advice look like? Yeah, so first um, is that I wish I had had an emergency break because with my fitness businesses, the story that I tell in the book is how the way that I survived the Great Recession is that I borrowed money from my mother-in-law. And that's a lot of what drives me because I don't think anybody should have to borrow money from their mother-in-law. Um, so that's a lot of what gets me out of bed in the morning. But uh, and. When I say I borrowed some money, what I'm really talking about is a quarter of a million bucks. And I can see the look on your face. It gets worse, dude. I actually didn't borrow it all at once. I borrowed it every two weeks. I would have to call her back for another 20 grand to make payroll. And I think if I had had an emergency break, when I got to 100,000, I'm hoping I would have stopped because <laughs> I got to a quarter of a million. And since then, I've paid her back. And you can see I'm still married. So uh, in the end, it worked out. Um, but I don't think it had to go that deep. 
I think I just kept digging myself a deeper and deeper hole. So for the, the, the solopreneurs out there, the entrepreneurs, I think the lesson is, is that I think in our society, we wrap ourselves in with um, our business and they become one in the same. And a lot of our self-worth gets tied up in the business. But if it's not working out, if your business isn't working, then you've got to figure out if there's a point where you're going to cut bait and go do something else where you can actually um, move it forward. And it's not a personal thing if there's a bankruptcy. I really believe it's a business decision. And so I think you just have to consider all of your options, have your emergency break, know what it is, and then follow the plan that, um, you know, I wish that uh, 10 years ago, I had had Rational John telling me, you know, we got to 100,000, man, let's just cut this off and go do something else instead of digging deeper. You know, after that fifth phone call asking for money, I'm not sure why I thought that something different would happen on phone calls six through 12. So that would be, that would be the first piece. Uh, and then the second piece is that really, uh, I love what I do now. And it took me a long time to find my true passion. So I spent a decade in the fitness business and I wasn't, uh, I'm not a, a fitness guy. So, you know, I, I do love getting in shape. I like working out. I like other people being healthy, but I, it wasn't my Starbucks coffee. Like I think Howard Schultz, he loved coffee and that passion led him to build a great empire. Um, and for me, fitness wasn't my passion and I still spent a decade uh, in that business. So for me, it's just, um, I wish I had told myself that if after a couple of years, you're not super excited to jump out of bed, you weren't put on earth to do what it is that you're doing, then again, it's looking for what you can pivot to. You don't have to do it in a, a spectacular way. You can build a bridge to something else. But it really, um, for me, is just, I wish I had maybe pivoted to doing what I'm doing right now a little bit earlier in hindsight. Yeah, love it. Powerful stuff, man. And those watching, listen, I know I end every podcast with this, but information without implementation is truly just the start of delusion. Information is the power. It's taking that information and taking action on it. That gives you the power to go out there and create the life that you know you want and deserve. And Jonathan shared so many amazing piece of advice with you guys today. Take something that you learn and go out there and take action on it. So again, you can create the life that you know you want and deserve. And as I said a moment ago, below are going to be all the links to check out Jonathan's book, check out recession.com, go through that assessment, which is free on their site, uh, which um, again, something that we all need to be doing, uh, planning and making sure that uh, we, we are doing this journey the best way we can, the most strategic way possible. So thank you guys for watching. Listen to Jonathan, man. I know how busy you are. Truly appreciate you taking time out of your busy AV here, dude. This has been a lot of fun. Really appreciate it. Rock on, brother. Yeah, you got it, bro. All right, you guys. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much.